positive spin on the Rupert person. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And especially also thanks to the other organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present our uh, results. And thanks to all of you that you stayed so long, even for the last talk. And I'll try to keep it, uh, I don't know, kind of short. So uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, so this is uh, the topic is um, spin dynamics and root by press piecing chains. And contrary to all the people here and stuff, I think you're coherent. And uh, in what sense it's coherent, I'll try to, uh, to show you in the rest of the talk. Um, being the last uh, of the workshop, of course, is on one hand good, uh, is on one hand bad, because it's uh, kind of you're all tired and, I don't know, maybe saturated. But it's also good in that I can uh, refer to many of the things that have been said already. And uh, I'll actually um, use the, uh, the uh, example of quantum annealing to motivate uh, why we're looking at uh, ripple pressing, or I mean, at this one aspect of why we're looking at ripple pressing. So um, this morning we've heard uh, about this nice uh, way of, of uh, uh, translating uh, quantum uh, annealing um, in the spin glass paradigm of all, all connectivity into this uh, gauge con local gauge, con gauge constraint uh, uh, model, uh, which is, uh, oops, is equivalent to this all-to-all -all connected um, uh, graph, but it's much easier to, uh, to handle experimentally, given that you can uh, implement these gauge constraints, because gauge constraints, because these uh, bonds here um, are just replaced by uh, local fields, which experimentally are much easier to and then, of course, quantum annealing is one of the, as we've heard this morning, one of the, um, let's say, uh, one way to do uh, quantum uh, computing uh, uh, that, that has been discussed a lot, um, adiabatic quantum computing. And uh, the question is, is, can it be done? And can there be a minimal working example how it can be done? And what's nice about this uh, is, okay, it's nice by itself, but what is even nicer is that uh, the guys who invented this have also come up with a concrete um, experimental implementation that seems kind of realistic uh, to be done in, in the experiment, which uh, requires uh, Rydberg REST interactions actually to implement these local gauge constraints as we heard this morning. And uh, so uh, the important ingredients uh, in going from here to here to actually do this in experiment um, are actually local adaptability, which um, in our experiment uh, has been shown. Um, it's the implementation of these local gauge constraints and especially control of interactions. This is one of the things that I will talk about in the, in the uh, rest of the talk. Uh, it actually also requires fine tuning and accurate knowledge of interactions, as we've uh, seen this morning. So you need to really be uh, able to, to implement these gauge con constraints in a very accurate way, or at least that's, that's in the proposal. And of course, you also need everything to be clear. Otherwise, it's adiabatic. Uh, Let's say adiabatic uh, speed up uh, is not as good as it can when there is concurrency. But of course, it's only a very, let's say, a specific um, implement, uh, or application. There, are, there is further applications in the, in the um, realm of, of quantum simulation. Of course, uh, uh, you can, or it has been proposed that you can also realize these widely tunable spin systems where this peak, for example, is one of these uh, nice uh, uh, fine tuned interactions or interaction potential set uh, can be realized pressing and can also be used for the anneater. Um, but they can, of course, also be used for looking at other spin models or spin systems, let's say. There's uh, just with p-states in general, there's anisotropic uh, blockades. So you can realize anisotropic models, which might be uh, interesting in some ways. And of course, if you can uh, use the dressing, push it uh, to a regime where you can also combine with motional dynamics, you might actually be able to see some kind of uh, density ordering, the road on minimum, or even something that is uh, super solid. There have been proposals for uh, 2D systems, um, but I guess it, it could also work uh, in 1D. Um, so there are also some ideas how you could go to interesting regimes and just the 1D dress uh, uh, gas with uh, motion. And of course, it's uh, a bit in the future, but uh, let's see how far we can. So with this, uh, I come to my, my uh, outline. So first, I will briefly give you an introduction on the basics so our experiment and uh, put back. Okay, so really starting from the basics, also of course about group by pressing. Then uh, tell you a little bit about how we implement long range and spin models. Then uh, come to our 1D results, uh, and, and that's where we show, uh, show this clear dynamics. And I give a brief So uh, the setup is this quantum gas, as a quantum gas microscope. So it's basically uh, in a very uh, in a schematic way shown here what we do. So we first prepare a two dimensional sample of the 87. Uh, we typically prepare mod insulators, and uh, in order to, to uh, get information on the system, what we do is we freeze it, we freeze the density, 
uh, shine in fluorescence light and pick up the fluorescence with a high resolution object. And, and by that, you get uh, information on uh, uh, the local occupation uh, of, a, of a lattice that we also uh, switch from. Um, so this is basically just uh, our, our, let's say, working horse. So in all of the experiments that are our experimental results that I show, uh, basically the modern oscillator is the starting state, and we use this uh, fluorescence detection to see what's been going on. And we combine this with uh, a Rydberg excitation. Our setup actually we have two ways to excite Rydberg atoms. We have this conventional, or more conventional, let's say, two photon excitation scheme with a 780 and a 480 nanometers laser that allows us to cover the S states. And uh, more recently, and this is actually the main focus of the talk, we've been uh, implementing this direct single photon excitation for P state, for which you basically need to sum these two wavelengths. We get to 297 nanometers, which is uh, it's still okay to do, but it's kind of less convenient than this uh, to uh, photon transition. But uh, on the positive side, you get much higher couplings, which is actually uh, uh, very <coughs> important for the, for the dressing, as I will show you. Um, and here you can see uh, actually a picture of single Rydberg atoms. So when we excite uh, into the Rydberg state, we cannot directly detect the Rydberg atoms, but what we do is we push the Garnstead atoms and we detect the Rydberg atoms via a deep pumper, and we can actually do this both for the S and for the P, and then we can take a, an image of converted uh, uh, Rydberg atoms uh, with local resolution and then see it goes as just like normal atoms in the ground, because they've been converted to ground. So uh, the basics of Rydberg physics that will be important for the rest is uh, blockade. Of course, you all know they're highly excited. They have strong interactions. This is a typical picture. We have blockade. We have the thunder interaction. And in our case, the blockade radius is between 1 and 1 micron. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it's nice to, uh, well, actually, uh, what's important is that uh, the separation of our atoms is approximately 500 nanometers, that's the lattice basic. So actually, uh, this is much larger in our case, uh, can be much larger in our case. And uh, can we actually measure this? Yes, we can measure this. And uh, what we do here is we uh, excite the Rydberg atoms, pump them down, and uh, check the correlations of the Rydberg atoms. And of course, blockade tells you that uh, if you have a Rydberg atom at a specific position, the next Rydberg atom, uh, can only appear at, at uh, some distance that is at a, at a minimal uh, size, basically. So here you see a suppression in the G2, where uh, one Rydberg atom blocks uh, other Rydberg atoms. This is for the S state, and we can do similar measurements for the P state. Uh, and as you can see, the P state has uh, less interaction energy, so smaller blockade. Uh, and also blockade is actually not quite that good. And at the moment, we, we still don't know uh, why this is the case. Um, I think actually it's, it's due to the way it's detected this. So it's just, uh, uh, I think, experimental uh, imperfections, but we've not really optimized this. So this is just a, a demonstration that there is blockade. And why is the blockade actually important? Well, the blockade is the basis of the dress potential and the dress interaction that uh, I want to introduce now. So uh, what do we do for dressing? For dressing, actually, uh, rather than coupling resonance to the Rydberg state, we only admix it. So you have uh, a high frequency omega and a detuning gas to the Rydberg state. Actually, we've heard about this this morning also. Uh, which gives rise to this uh, superposition state, and as such, uh, G tilde inherits a little bit of the Lutberg Lutberg interaction because of the small mixture, but it also acquires some finite Lutberg state lifetime. And of course, you can uh, say then, because the ground state becomes a little bit of a Lutberg state, it also has to get some interaction properties of the Lutberg state. That's one, uh, one way of seeing this. Of course, the other way of seeing the, inter the, the dressed uh, interaction is uh, the way it was introduced this morning. You can see it actually as a light shift of uh, two atoms that is modified by the Rydberg blockade. So if you take two atoms that are both uh, in the stress state, you bring them close together, uh, the light shift cannot be as it is uh, in a non-interacting system, but it has to be modified. And that's actually what gives rise to the stress interaction. And uh, this has been nicely explained, of course, this morning. What I find always kind of uh, impressive, impressive is if you look at the, uh, the energy scales involved. So if you take this uh, two atom, four level system, basically, um, and you diagonalize it uh, in zero order, of course, you get uh, three energy uh, uh, states. You get uh, the ground, the, the state that is uh, basically the ground ground light. You get one where you have one flip back uh, atom and symmetric and anti-symmetric position, and you have a flip back, flip back state here. So this is kind of the typical picture that I showed you before, where you, uh, you couple from the ground ground to the flip back, you get blockade and um, if you zoom in, and you zoom in by a factor of 1,000 in this case, approximately to this ground state, a manifold, of course what you see is not actually zero, but you have an AC star shift, because you've shifted it, you've coupled off resonance to 
computer with that state. Um, but still, there's no interaction, but the QR, or at least it doesn't look like there's interaction. What you have to do is you have to actually zoom in another factor of 100 to see that this ground fast state, the uh, energy level is not flat, but there's a, a distance dependence. And this is actually the dress the potential is. As I say, it's a, a modification of this AC star shift of a pair state um, for distances that are close because you lose puffing to the, the blockaded uh, ripper reflex state. And uh, to give you some idea on the scaling, so this soft core height here, so this is actually the famous soft core, soft core height here, only scales with laser parameters um, because it's actually the depth of this uh, AC star shift that controls this height of the step. Uh, and uh, the interaction enters in the, in the range of this potential uh, uh, in a similar way as the, in the block equation. So it's quite a weak, uh, weak dependence. So <coughs> with this uh, all said, we are actually set uh, to look at uh, our experimental results uh, of repercussing in 2D, where uh, we basically made a proof of principle of that as well. So what you see here is you see the initial state uh, that we started with. It's a basically 200 atom approximately spin system, where, uh, which is spin polarized and single ground state spin, and uh, then we apply the dressing, and you see some, some uh, evolution here, and uh, what you see here is actually uh, the, the, let's say the consequence that the, the two, uh, that the uh, dressing is asymmetric in the sense that if you build a spin system, you only have one state interacting. So uh, this is actually quite nice that you can directly see this effect. Uh, so experimentally, what do we do? Um, in this case, we build uh, a spin system actually down here in the F equals two, uh, F equals one, uh, uh, opinion ground state uh, manifold. Uh, we couple this uh, uh, state, F equals two state, off resonantly with the detuning data that we can choose, of course, and add to the omega to the 31 p one half state, and we uh, couple it only to this MJ equals plus one half. And actually, we make sure that we only couple to this MJ plus one half both by the polarization and also by a Siemens. Why is this important? Actually, it's important because we only want to couple to a single uh, uh, look -back, look -back interaction potential. So here, what you see is actually you see this uh, Van der Waals potential. It's a real calculation. Uh, you have uh, these potentials here. Uh, you have another potential down here, which is uh, uh, minus one half, minus one half, and then you have these funny potentials that are actually not at all Van der Waals, and we actually don't want to couple to any any potential like those, but we really want to couple to a nice Van der Waals potential, like with the red one, and the red one is actually the one where you have uh, two plus one half atoms. And if you couple now uh, both this mj equals plus one half and mj equals minus one half, you would also couple it to other potential curves, and you want to avoid that because that could lead uh, to unwanted resonances, and actually uh, we, we, we detected some of those resonances here as uh, kind of drags in our initial sample. So what we think, what happened here is that we, by accident, uh, uh, hit uh, uh, resonances here, uh, pair resonances in these uh, potential curves, by actually not coupling in an ice wave. So by not uh, being off resonant, as, as indicated here with this dash, dash line, uh, to this red uh, potential curve, but rather hitting resonances uh, right there uh, by having a bad polarization. So this is kind of important uh, that you couple nicely to this uh, 1 over R to the 6 uh, of potential. Um, as I already said, we define them as a spin basis here, and actually we've already seen this also in this workshop that uh, in the spin basis we can define an easing model. And we define this easing model in a ground state. Of course, that means that in a ground state we can uh, apply a transverse field by just driving a microwave uh, or switching on a microwave coupling. In this form, uh, as a sigma x operator, we have a longitudinal field. Uh, where uh, it enters uh, global light shifts, basically, that's just an offset between spin up and spin down. Um, it's basically a just a rotating frame, so if, if it doesn't change or, or if you can control it, you can rotate it away as long as there's no sigma x field. Um, and we have the spin spin interaction, uh, which of course you can depict as uh, two spins uh, pointing in the same direction, having a different energy shift than two spins pointing in opposite directions. Um, just uh, to repeat, so we have these this ground state spin bases here. We can put a detuning data, it's just a light shift, for example. So we can obviously add a thing to do that. Uh, also, basically, dependent on the principle. Uh, we can couple uh, them by microwave uh, uh, to introduce a transfer field or to prepare any arbitrary states in principle. So that's very easy with, with the microwave uh, in the ground state because everything is stable. And the interaction is this. Uh, 
for continuing actually with our own results, I should uh, give credit to the people that have uh, done work before, and actually it's uh, two results that also we've already seen here. Um, and I split this uh, into, let's say, the two sides. So we have these many body systems with many, many atoms and three dimensions, and we've heard from K4 that here it's actually very hard to, to see something of the pressing because you get this uh, large resonance problem that is due to, or has been attributed to these uh, impurity P state atoms uh, in this case, which then uh, give rise to the dipole exchange, broad resonance, and, uh, and give rise to loss or, or re -pump, re deep pumping or uh, distribution of, uncontrolled distribution of, uh, of uh, spin population. On the other hand, we've seen, uh, or there have been these nice uh, uh, results uh, from the Sandia lab, uh, where they showed very nicely with two atoms, precision atoms, and optical breather, uh, this soft course, so the concept, proof of concept of the pressing. Uh, in a very nice way. Um, and of course, I should also add these nice results that we've seen this morning, these kind of textbook results on, on how the recoil scales with the admixture uh, and also the, uh, uh, the trapping of the uh, dress levels. So, uh, basically, uh, to summarize, so in this 3D many body case, it seems to be quite hard to progressing, but two cesium atoms looks super nice, so everything seems to be fine. So, the question is what is in the middle, and actually, what I will show you in the following is uh, kind of, I don't know, somewhere in the middle here. So it's more than two, but less than ten. <coughs> so uh, first, uh, I actually want to show you what we've done in 2D, and I actually want to show this to you only very briefly. So here, the, the goal was basically to show that in 2D we get the stress interaction at all. And uh, the way we did this was actually to do uh, spin superposition, switch on the stress interaction in the, uh, or the up spin, and then detect how the dress interaction leads to phase shifts. And uh, what, you what you see here is actually a spin-spin correlation that detects these phase-phase uh, 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 correlations in the end that are there to, due to the dress interaction. And uh, what you can see is actually um, how these phase-phase or spin-spin correlation build up versus uh, the time that you leave the dressing light on. And actually uh, comparing this to the interaction or the inverse interaction, uh, interactions to kilohertz, so the inverse interaction, or the interaction time is 500 microseconds. This happens in a very, very short time. So you correlate spins in a very, very short time, but you see clearly that uh, we have this interaction, and actually this interaction uh, kind of resembles this kind of soft report that you would expect uh, on the reference. And it actually also agrees very well with the theory, uh, where well, the theory is just uh, based on uh, kind of uh, uh, unitary dynamics and up initio actually. Uh, what is quite nice about uh, the dressing in general is this uh, possibility to tune the interaction. And this is uh, shown here, or the result is shown here. So if uh, instead of uh, going to a configuration where we expect isotropic clipback clipback interaction, uh, uh, if instead of doing that, we go to a configuration where the interaction is anisotropic, uh, this is actually resembled also in the, or reflected also in the spin spin correlation. So we can really measure on and implement uh, anisotropic uh, interaction as well. Uh, uh, which you just get by tuning the, the quantization axis. Of course, you also get that if you have resonant, uh, uh, or if you use resonant group uh, uh, interactions, but uh, interesting, uh, it, it's also quite nice. So one problem, of course, or not of course, but unfortunately, in 2D is that there's the strong decoherence. And uh, strong decoherence, what do I mean? Well, I mean if I uh, look at the atom number that we have once we uh, done our flip-back dressing, it actually decreases uh, dramatically fast. And if you look at the numbers, we fit, uh, or we extract from the theory, in this case, actually 130 microseconds, and we expect a lifetime of four milliseconds. So it's really uh, much, much shorter. And of course, flip-back dressing uh, only works uh, if you reach this kind of ideal uh, uh, lifetime. Otherwise, <coughs> the concept of, of flip-back dressing is, is kind of obsolete, or let's say, to, to say positively, we want to be as good as possible before uh, uh, to, to get something uh, um, The question, of course, then was uh, why is it so short? And uh, one interesting thing that we also noticed is that we had, or we observed, this strong bimodality. So uh, the, the events that we detected really kind of fell into two separate classes. So either uh, kind of uh, everything was nice, so that's the right key, or something went totally bad. And uh, what this led to, in combination also with other results from Craig Porter, of course, and uh, some other measurements we did, 
uh, wants to, to um, uh, let's say, uh, and make the, the hypothesis also that we have this uh, black body uh, uh, induced uh, decay into nearby interacting states that is actually uh, enhanced enhanced by uh, the number of atoms. And the reason is that if you have a single uh, atom that decays into a nearby state, due to the uh, strong resin laser, which suddenly becomes resonant, you actually can then very fast resonantly excite Rydberg atoms, which then leads to an avalanche, and you lose the atoms extremely fast. And uh, this is this uh, 1 over n scaling here that uh, Dre, Dre also mentioned. And uh, of course, one uh, obvious solution to this is uh, reduce the number of atoms. We have some other ideas. Uh, we also tried some more. Things uh, like, for example, this pulse uh, blessing scheme that Trey also mentioned, and this also seems to help. Uh, but uh, for the first uh, trial, actually, uh, we decided to go for reducing the number to see if this helps uh, at all. And uh, so this brings me uh, to the next uh, topic uh, with that blessing in one system. So we decided not only to go to smaller 2D systems, so starting from this, not only go to smaller 2D, but uh, use our SLM and directly go to a 1D chain. And the reason is that this money chain is actually a very, let's say, clean system, uh, easy system, easy to understand, and uh, it's a good kind of uh, test bed to, to check what's going on. And these are just two examples, so we can either uh, prepare chains like this, we can also uh, increase the spacing by a factor of two, unfortunately, the square root two, unfortunately, by, uh, in this case, uh, the fidelity of the preparation is much worse. But uh, let's Directly, yeah. Uh, let me directly show you what we observed then for the first time, and it's actually uh, uh, very good news. If I now take the same kind of lifetime curve as before for the 2D case, you see that the lifetime is uh, tremendously increased. Before we had lifetime from something like 120 or 130 microseconds. Now it's 1.2 milliseconds, and uh, even more, the interaction uh, has increased by a factor of six. So really, the interaction to lifetime ratio or the interaction times lifetime. Uh, factor uh, uh, product is, is much better uh, in this one d configuration. And um, you go, you go different state. Pardon? So why, why is there an action? Uh, because we changed. Uh, so the omega increased by a factor of three. I see. I see. And uh, also the delta action went down. But it's still the same with state. It's the same with state. So there's no other changes. Basically, just the admixture that uh, that changed and the omega, uh, which gives you a, a large increase action. Um, so this is, is uh, super good news, and especially uh, uh, what we also see is that uh, we don't seem to have correlated losses. So if I look at, at histograms here, it's really just, uh, let, let's say, Watsonian uh, or Gaussian, and uh, how, how, how many are there? So it's, uh, it's very nice. It's not bimodal. Uh, and uh, OK, uh, this is the atom number, but of course the atom number uh, doesn't tell you on atom number loss, atom number per, uh, doesn't tell you that you are still <coughs> because of course you could also have dephasing. So the question is how can we actually check that that we, we still have coherent dynamics going on and it's not just uh, basically very uh, fast dephasing versions or very short D2, but uh, 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 a long T1. And uh, there we actually uh, thought about how, how to, uh, to measure this, and we came up with this uh, idea of, of measuring collapse and revivals uh, of an initial superposition state. And of course, if you start with an initial superposition state, uh, you need to maintain the coherence, uh, or if you maintain the coherence, uh, and, and you drive the, the individual components of the superposition state, you'll see a dephasing, and then a rephasing of everything between the three. And one of the examples, or one of the, let's say, most uh, well-known examples of this is, of course, if you start with the coherent state and you evolve it in the clock basis, uh, then you, you see dephasing of this coherent state, and once all these frequencies of the clock base, of the populated clock basis, have rephased the coherent state on the And there are very nice examples of these, uh, of this kind of, uh, let's say, idea uh, in uh, two systems, one in a VC with context interactions, where, you exactly, or where they exactly study this Dephasing and rephasing of coherent states in the lattice, and they look at this as uh, the disappearance and the reappearance of interference peaks uh, when the atoms were brought from, uh, from the lattice uh, in time of flight. Uh, and uh, the second one is uh, this uh, very famous experiment uh, where uh, at first they check the quantization of the light field interacting, or the quantization of the light field interacting or driving. Uh, a single Rydberg atom transversing the cavity uh, um, 
and and well protecting the population of this Rydberg, uh, of this uh, of the Rydberg land is actually they were able to actually not only uh, but show the quantization <coughs> but also show the spectral content like uh, really uh, look at how the the, the uh, population of the moles in the is. So what they did here is actually they looked at this uh, time, this oscillation curve, so these feedings, and they could extract information on the content uh, on the on the let's say superposition, on the, yeah, on the uh, weight of the box basis in the superposition state. Um, so the, the message is that from these time trends you can actually learn something about your uh, let's say your population. And, uh, this is actually something that uh, I also want to uh, try to to show you how how we. So uh, here's uh, the idea of our experiment. So we start uh, uh, in a superposition state. Actually, what we do is we flip uh, uh, in our spin chain all spins in the uh, uh, sy direction. So in the uh, equator plane of the flop sphere, just using microwave pulse with interactions switched off. We can easily do that because stress interactions can be switched at light. So uh, we switch the dressing laser off, uh, do this flip with the microwave, uh, and then uh, uh, we can perfectly prepare the state. And um, after that, we quench on the interaction. So we start letting these uh, spins interact with an SCSC interaction uh, of this shape. And that's just the dress potential that we use in our case, uh, normalized to the uh, nearest neighbor uh, interaction. And uh, this value is about 13 kilohertz, as I showed you before. And uh, what happens is, of course, as I uh, explained to you before, because we start with the super position state, you get the uh, collapse and revival. So what is shown here is actually the probability uh, uh, average over the chain for a single atom to be pointing back in the initial uh, in the initial direction or minus the initial direction. And, and as you see here, uh, initially, of course, you point perfectly in the initial direction, then you deface, and then you see these uh, revivals here, then it defaces completely for some time, and then after a longer time, you see uh, a revival again in this, uh, in this Initial pointing in the initial direction, and uh, this revival is not perfect, so it's not a, a full revival in the sense that really all the frequencies have come back to the uh, to the uh, uh, well to the same. I know all the spins have come back uh, in the same direction, but part of them has, and that's uh, why that is uh, it's actually uh, uh, part of what I'm going to tell you in the next slides. Uh, then the question is how how can we detect this? And for this in Mondi, actually, we can uh, do a quite nice trick. We can uh, do a stern gala separation of these spins in, in one direction. We prepare a chain like this, so it's rotated in this case. And if, uh, then we do the spin dynamics. Uh, and after the spin dynamics is finished, actually, we apply a magnetic field gradient in this direction. So the uh, one spin component is, is pulled in one direction, the other spin component is pulled in the other direction. And uh, so here you see different snapshots for different times. Uh, in this evolution, so uh, yeah, that's just uh, some, some images that, that you observe. What you see is that really all the spins, uh, well, not, that there are no spins here in between, so we have quite a high fidelity to say that uh, we have two spins, and it's it's, uh, it's quite good, to, uh, quite easy to discriminate. Um, so uh, what is uh, important, and of course it's kind of clear, because interaction is the only energy, or the interaction. Uh, but let's say interaction, SC, SC interaction is the only term that is uh, present here. And it's quite clear that uh, the spin interactions at different distances somehow have to be uh, responsible for, for this revival dynamics. <coughs> and uh, so let me briefly show you this, uh, the experimental data. So here's what we, what we actually get upon doing this. So uh, you see exactly the two uh, things that I, I just described. So the one spin, or the number of spins pointing in one spin, in the initial spin direction and the ones pointing in the negative initial spin direction. And uh, so you see uh, what I described is initially a fast loss of the magnetization, so demagnetization, but then you see these bumps here and here and here, okay, and then also at later times. There still seems to be some dynamics, so it doesn't go all the way to zero, uh, which is what you would expect if it was completely different or completely defaced. So there seems to be some stuff going on. And uh, now the question is, of course, uh, can we understand uh, the exact structure of this? Um, so let me first uh, zoom into this initial dynamics and uh, show you this again. So here, uh, if you look at it, uh, initially we get a steep phasing, then we get uh, one maximum after uh, one inverse uh, interactions. So one inverse nearest neighbor interaction. 
we get the, the peak at two inverse nearest neighbor interactions, and we get a peak at approximately five inverse nearest neighbor interactions. And the question is, well, why does this come from? So where, where does this come from? And uh, to explain this, actually, um, uh, let's just look at the, how this dynamics happens. So let's just look at unitary dynamics. So of course, uh, if we start with the, the initial state, uh, that is not an eigenstate state of this H, this Hamiltonian here, we know that the H dynamics would be still governed by this H. And of course, the H is kind of easy to diagonalize. You have these many body eigenstates that are just bit strings of spins pointing up and down. And uh, the local, so the, the uh, local magnetization, so our observable basically, average of the local magnetization over the chain uh, is it's very easy to do time evolves right on time evolution. You just uh, get this uh, uh, this matrix element of the, of the SY operator in this many body basis, and you get the eigen energies of this uh, of the many body space. And the question is now, can we understand from this equation why we get these uh, uh, revivals? And uh, yeah, first question is actually. Uh, which of the frequencies here, so in principle all the frequencies here could contribute. Actually what I should say is that our initial state of course is kind of wide in this many body basis. So we prepare a superposition state um, of all of these many body states. But not all of those many body states actually contribute. So only the, those many body states contribute uh, uh, to this time evolution uh, where this matrix element doesn't vanish. And it's very easy to see that uh, this, what this operator does here it does this is corresponds to a local spin flip. So only states uh, differing by a single local spin flip contribute. So this, these two states uh, in this product here, so the energies of these two states will contribute, uh, but uh, these two states will not contribute because they differ by, not differ, don't differ by a single spin flip. So you see here a spin flip, and here a spin flip. So uh, the, uh, the many body element of this will be zero. And now, uh, of course, uh, it's also easy to see that uh, the local spin flip in this many body basis has to do something with the interaction energy. <coughs> so of course, uh, flipping a uh, spin from this configuration to this configuration in, in this uh, units here corresponds to an uh, energy cost of 2B. Uh, uh, that's just well, that's just what the interaction energy measures, basically. So uh, can we understand then the structure of the revivals uh, as, as a whole, basically? And uh, for this, we look at the occurrence of all relevant, uh, let's say, uh, energy differences in, in the many body bases. And uh, uh, this is shown here. So the gray stuff is, is all energy differences without the selection by the, by the um, SY magnetization. And the blue ones are the ones that are relevant. And actually, you see a dominant peak at 0. You see one at 1 over u, uh, at, at u0 you see uh, one at u0 plus minus uh, uh, u0 over 10 and plus minus u0 over 5 and you see these uh, at approximately uh, u0 um, over 2 and if you take these uh, delta nu and you take the inverse uh, you actually get uh, exactly uh, 1 over u0, 2 over u0 and 5 over, over u0 which is exactly the, uh, the times at which we see these revivals and of course, if you look back into this potential, it's clear uh, that, uh, or it's, it, you notice that uh, here in our case, the next nearest neighbor interaction is basically 0.2 times the nearest neighbor interaction. And that's exactly how you can explain this revival at 5 was at 0. And uh, well, the other ones that I've explained. And maybe to give you an idea, uh, if you just had uh, nearest neighbor interactions, so just a simple, easy model, you would actually expect full revivals in this case. So at every u over zero, you would get a revival. So you can say actually in this case that this extended range interaction uh, uh, is, is responsible for the fact that, uh, that these revivals don't go up all the way back to one. So it's, it's just a damping in a sense by uh, mixing in these longer range interaction uh, to, the, to the easy model. That's one way of understanding. So in the easy you would have uh, much less frequency yeah, uh, components. <coughs> so that explains the dynamics of magnetization. To be honest, can I, can I ask to this, the solid curve, is this fully coherent? Dynamics? Yes, the so, I forgot, sorry. <coughs> the solid curve is basically uh, uh, just fully coherent, there's no... You didn't do any tricks to this curve? No, nothing. <laughs> so there's, uh, I calibrate the radio frequency. Uh, the radio frequency calibration is actually pretty good. It's, it's like 0.3% or so. And nothing, I, I, like, 
to do only thing actually what goes in is uh, the initial uh, distribution of, of the chains because of course we don't repair uh, perfect chains uh, in every shot. We have some holes, but actually it's interesting to see what the holes do is uh, they suppress every second revival uh, because you have basically missing neighbors and that gives you just a factor of two in here. And otherwise that's nothing. Detection efficiency. What? Detection efficiency. Well, it's, it's, I saw detection efficiency, I tried to estimate uh, from but the separation. But it's included in the solid curve. Detection efficiency. Did you No, no, there's no, nothing we scale. Okay. Very, very impressive. <laughs> that's only, uh, the only thing that goes in is the initial. Uh, and there's no free parameter essentially. So, so what's the probability of having a whole complicated chain? Uh, the chain is uh, 10 atoms, plus minus I think 1.4, so we get some fluctuations. And the density is I think 87%. So it's not great, so these 1D chains are actually not so easy to, to produce because you have to be quite, uh, you are quite sensitive to face, face errors in everything, so like small pieces to use a lot of holes. So, yeah, it's just the unitary dynamics. But the fact that this chain is so long doesn't matter to me. If, if you had like a chain of three, yeah. would you see the same thing? Well, uh, in a chain of three, uh, in a chain of three with periodic boundary conditions, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's open boundary. <laughs> No, I mean the boundary. I know. Of course, the boundary. You would, you would, you would, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it should be quite you Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess, well, of course, you also get it, uh, and I'm pretty sure you would get the same frequency components, but the weights will change, of course. Uh, so I can look so qualitatively the same, the revivals, but quantitatively the same. Um, okay, uh, so this was the magnetization. Uh, of course, the microscopic detection also allows us to look at correlation. And actually, uh, to answer the question, how does the collab collapse dynamics occur? Uh, so here's the cartoon. Initially, the all splits points in the y direction. Then I told you that, uh, okay, due to the interaction, you get some, let's say, some dephasing. And the question is, is this due to correlations? And uh, the answer is yes, it's due to correlations. What we see here, initially, uh, when, when all, uh, all splits point in one direction, and then you see strong nearest neighbor correlation. Here. And uh, this is basically the origin of the collapse. So basically, the collapse, the first revival happens here, so this is really just uh, the, the origin of this collapse. And then you can, of course, also look at next nearest neighbor correlations. And here, uh, basically, we see this uh, one peak, uh, which is, the, let's say, the most uh, the dominant feature. Um, and actually, this uh, Non-zero next nearest neighbor correlation is direct proof also of the long range of, of the long range of the non-zero next nearest neighbor interaction. Uh, because the only way uh, to basically make two spins talk in this chain is by direct interaction because you don't have moving quality particles if you like. So it's, there's no uh, uh, plus minus term that, that kind of allows excitations to propagate. It's really in this case the direct interaction between the two spins that leads to this next non-zero next nearest neighbor correlation. Um, and then uh, one final thing that uh, I actually find quite nice and actually goes a bit into this direction of decoherence. Um, what we can also do is, of course, we can look at the parity of the, the states that we, that we created. Basically. Or more uh, concretely, we actually can look at the parity of the number of spins pointing in the initial direction, or in, actually not in the initial direction, so in the, in the initially empty spin uh, directions so in the minus SY direction. And if you look at the easy model, you see that it's very conserving, and because we started with zero excitations in this initial, initially minus direction, uh, uh, we also expect that uh, we only get even numbers of, of uh, this uh, negative SY spin. And uh, of course, in a perfect leading chain, it would be perfectly conserved this parity, uh, and you would expect a perfect uh, modulation on the histograms that are shown here. They would only expect 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8 spins, uh, uh, 8 spins pointing in the minus y direction. And experimentally, of course, the complex is, is reduced. Um, and you can also, again, see this as a consequence of this pair creation of spin excitations. So you can only flip spins pairwise. That's a direct consequence of how the human model is, uh, in this case, more general. And moreover, uh, this uh, parity, if we quantify it, so if we take 50 minus 1 times the 
so the expectation value of minus 1 times the number of, of spins in this uh, minus y or minus sy direction. Um, and we look at how this evolves in time. It's a very, very sensitive uh, way to quantify the decoherence in our system because it's exponentially sensitive in the number of atoms. So if you have a single spin that flips in the wrong direction, actually your parity changes completely. So you, instead of if you let's say if you have a, a random spin flip, you'd instead of see instead of seeing two, uh, uh, you would only see well, one or uh, with a slight probability. Of course, you also have a 50 percent probability. You still uh, well, while it changes, uh, that's the thing about the concrete example. And it's extremely sensitive in the number of atoms, and um, this actually allows us. Uh, so so this is the data for this, and what we extract is actually we extract a time constant of 130 microseconds. Which, if you remember the time, the lifetime of the, the atoms that I showed you initially, uh, which was 1.2 milliseconds, uh, uh, which is basically so this 1. Point, uh, this is 0.13 milliseconds taking tau over n, taking approximately 10 atoms in each end. And uh, this actually allows us to uh, conclude that the strongest source of deep phasing or deep coherence in our system is really the loss of individual atoms, because this really changes the parity completely. So if you lose a single atom and you expect two in the state, you only have one, and, and, and everything is uh, inverted, and, and that's very bad. And uh, what you can also conclude, taking a, a bit more information on the system and exactly how you expect this decay to happen theoretically, um, we reach basically in that uh, kind of theoretically uh, optimal uh, uh, coherence in, in the Rydberg basic for our parameters, which means for this specific omega and delta. If you change, if you change the omega and delta, you can of course get a better interaction tool. DK ratios. Uh, and uh, this brings me now to the, to the conclusion. So uh, I told you that we studied the results. I'm studying the 2D uh, easy models with Rupert Kressing, also the interaction bench uh, in 1D and its uh, colors and revivals of the magnetization, uh, where we see this nice uh, improvement of, of lifetimes uh, compared to 2D and uh, this interaction driven magnetization dynamics. And of course, uh, uh, the question is now. Uh, going from 1D back to 2D, when does uh, this start to get bad again? So where do we get uh, the selective loss again? And of course, it's one of the open questions that we want to address. And of course, uh, it's also it's uh, necessary for this quantum uh, leader. So trying to get into this direction, we also have to go to 2D again. And of course, we can start with a ladder system or something, see how things evolve. Uh, if we go up an atom number, then also going to these more complex interactions, I think is quite nice because this also will, if it works the way it was proposed, this also will boost the interaction to decay uh, uh, ratio. Uh, and of course, uh, still uh, in the far future, maybe uh, this motion of time scales will become an issue again. Maybe in the one system, we are not so so far from this. And uh, with this, I would like to thank the team, so Christian, especially, and Emmanuel, of course. And uh, yeah, so this is the team that basically maintains the experiment. And of course, also Thomas and Rick, uh, who we've uh, worked together with, with these in these two projects, and who we've uh, um, yeah had uh, many nice discussions with, and who helped us uh, a lot with, with developing the ideas, and also especially with the tension mechanisms uh, that went into the theory of, of this uh, dynamics. And of course, I should also acknowledge Alex Betz and Peter Zola, uh, with whom we talked a lot initially on, on the ideas of this progressing. And that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, Solomon? I hope I misunderstood. Did you just say the curve, the solid line there, is purely coherent dynamics without decoherence? Yes. But in the previous slide, you showed that the parity is broken over the similar time scale, right? Uh, yes. But so this is normalized to the atom number, basically. So actually, this is an interesting point because it shows that uh, loss of atoms is so this thing is not very sensitive to to loss of atoms. So and also, there is some angle that you can yes. Line to. Yes, you could, and yeah, okay. The question is, I mean, if you look at the, the atom loss actually on this time scale, <laughs> uh, it's probably only ten percent or so. So I think it's. Uh, but if you can you go back to this previous slide because here it's the the. X, the time scale is exactly the same, but the, the parity seems to go already to zero. Yes, yeah, but the parity is excellent. Like this is n times more sensitive than the I think. So you, this is the point. So you can actually, 
so, so this, I think this is actually the thing that you, if you want to think about one the meaning, for example, you have to get this script. And also if you want to see a GNC state or anything that's uh, So this is kind of uh, so, so why, does it, why does it go down? Is it there? Is it if I show it in the course of this work, you know, or is it you know what about like for example you guys work in this uh Okay, yes. Yeah, so that's the reason why we are we start not at oh, one, but at one. So it's already kind of kind of yeah, so so our, our right? magnetic well so uh, effective, right? effective you get a little bit of defacing, but it's still it's again it's, it's exponential, so the magnetic field uh, defacing time is three four it's about three milliseconds. So uh, actually it's well beyond uh, the scale here. Um, but of course, so what we do is actually during this experiment, we first of all we do a spin echo, uh, and second we keep the uh, time between uh, between the pulses constant, uh, and we only change the length of the pressing pulses. So we always have kind of the same decoherence due to magnetic field, and um, that's why we start here with 0.4. And actually, this is quite consistent. If you uh, take uh, three milliseconds. Uh, this, I think, gives you 95% uh, contrast at 1 millisecond, and because you have to multiply it with a factor of 10, you arrive somewhere. So 3 millisecond is just your RMC. It's the, no, it's the echo. It's the echo. Yes. 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 I think it's like 250 mm -hmm. microseconds. But uh, it's Daniel, like, it's both different. Sorry, Daniel? So, yeah. Are there any edge effects in this here? So would this look better if you had, a, you know, like a ring? Yeah, so that's like the frequencies like over the system match mode. Yeah. Because the observable you're plotting is sort of, yeah, so the, the second graph on the right. Yes. Uh, so it's sort of, I guess, averaging over the entire 1B yes. chain, right? Yes, I can tell you what happens with the edge. So in this case, in our experiment, uh, the edge, like having a, a circular uh, ring would not be better uh, because we have holes in the chain, which is effectively an edge. Uh, if you put a hole, it's like an edge. Um, and what the edge does is basically, as I say, it gives you frequency contributions at half the frequency, essentially. So it uh, has uh, kind of the edge spin. Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, from where? Because we can see this. So um, the edge spin has been involved with half the frequency of the bulb. So this is just a calculation, it's easy to do. Uh, this is a, a nearest neighbor easing case, uh, and this is what we would expect. And uh, this is just a spin magnetization over the spin chain, essentially. And you see here in the easing case, uh, as well as in our case, the edge spin just has half the frequency, just because it misses one neighbor, so it oscillates it after. And actually it goes all the way. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is what the edge spin, why, why you get more frequency into the edges. And uh, if you could bend the system to a circular thing, uh, everything would be homogeneous. Everything would oscillate at, at the frequency loop. And the same applies here. And actually, interestingly, here, uh, also the spin, of course, because you have interaction. Like, you're also missing uh, something for the spin near, na neighboring the edge spin. Uh, you also see different dynamics. And this also has slightly different uh, dynamics. And I guess you don't remember the single shots, but we have single shots where we see exactly at the right of here, we see exactly this configuration, which is kind of nice. Yeah. But in that sense, the edge, uh, in an ideal system, it, it would matter, but for us, because we have holes. Maybe you said it, but what's the reason that when you go from 2 to 1, you see Yeah, very good uh, question. I think it's mostly probably the atom number. Uh, but of course, then, if you think about this uh, loss process, as a facilitation process, and the facilitation shell goes from a circle to two points, and it's much easier to avoid this, I guess. Um, what might also be interesting, actually, is uh, I checked the, the interaction energy, or the, the interaction to lifetime ratio uh, for closer detuned addressing, and actually it doesn't seem to be much worse for closer detuned. So we can actually significantly improve this. Uh, and in this experiment, we didn't do it because the time is. Uh, this, this yeah. Each, uh, each atom has yeah. finds two neighbors that can, can uh, cover the two. Unless your shell is very thin in space, so you may miss 
that yeah, yes, but still, I mean, you excite uh, an atom, or well, uh, that's my picture is uh, you uh, create basically a real river excitation in an S state, just from the dress state as a direct kind of return into the neighboring S state. And the question is, does it localize? I guess maybe in that case it would localize, and then you have to, I mean, that's, it could also happen all in parallel, but that's, un, I don't know, maybe unlikely. Yeah. So it could also be that the shell is, is too narrow, or we miss it, or it's too large. It's, we don't really know. We have to it's like bang dependent on this order. So we didn't find the specific resonances uh, uh, where we, we kind of see an enhanced facilitation or something. Uh, I tried to look for it, and I found a resonance, and it turned out to be uh, a noise. So uh, this is a lot of a lot. So that's no reason. Uh, Speaking of resonances in your 2D pictures, uh, it seemed like there were these clear lines on some of the yes, lines. Yes. Could you comment on that? Is that is that just an artifact, or was that uh, a system? Yeah, yeah. So these three pictures are taken for the same uh, configuration. That says they are repeatable. Um, but basically, I only have approximately ten pictures for this configuration. So I don't know. This is one thing we wanted to study. What we think is that this is a kind of facilitation process where you, due to off-resonance scattering, or I don't know, some process you. Uh, get an initial seed, and then because you get resonance, uh, in resonance, uh, due to interaction, you then uh, kill basically uh, a line. And this one, if there was a preferred direction, yeah, there's always okay, like 45 I, degrees. I, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, magnetic field. Maybe, I don't know. This is one of the things we wanted to check. Uh, it's a nice, it's a nice effect. Last question, Manuel. Did you check for entanglement? I didn't get it, so the C1, C2 was just C plus C, C plus C, or was this a... Yeah, sorry, this, yeah, sorry, yeah, this is a C, uh, sigma C, sigma C, and in principle, at the first minimum, so here, this is easing, here you would expect a cluster state, but this is terribly difficult to detect if you don't, uh, if you cannot measure local uh, S, X, S, C correlations, at least that's what my knowledge uh, on this is, uh, and uh, I've try to find some easier ways, like using some witnesses, uh, but that's just, yeah, but the principle uh, entanglement, of course, would be very nice, and because everything is in the ground state, uh, it would be easy to form global, uh, let's say, tomography or something, I don't know, for, like Mergling or Smosini or something would be very easy, but that doesn't could do the matter for the cluster state. Concurrent. Yeah, maybe. All right, then, please, thank you, everyone.